to see a 9-9. Olga Corbett's won a gold medal. There it is. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Hello, I'm Vince Hunt and welcome to our podcast series exploring key moments in Cold War sports history. So far, we've discussed more than 20 of these moments, with plenty more to come. So please, keep listening and share your thoughts on the rate and review pages. And it's good to hear from you. In this podcast, I'll be talking about South Africa and its apartheid regime, which dated back to 1948 and lasted almost exactly the same length of time as the Cold War. My guest is John Norwright, a professor of sport at the University of North Texas. John, South Africa, very complicated situation, but an awful lot of sport. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people don't automatically think of South Africa in terms of the Cold War. But the reason it was it was really important is it was the one place where the United States could get strategic minerals, uh, uranium, plutonium, et cetera, for the nuclear program that were only obtainable uh, within the Soviet bloc, particularly the Soviet Union, uh, if they didn't get it from South Africa. So it made South Africa a very complex issue uh, for the United States. And South Africa was also important because as a former part of the British uh, Empire and Commonwealth, it had a sporting culture that mirrored that of the rest of uh, the English-speaking world outside the U.S. So it, it, it creates a complex a series of questions to ask in relation to the Cold War. And in terms of sporting prowess, when does South Africa start to become an important nation? Well, it really goes back to uh, the early 20th century with cricket and rugby tours, and especially to 1906 when the first uh, Springbok team, South African rugby team, toured the British Isles. And this occurred a year after the New Zealand All Blacks did their first tour, and both teams swept aside almost all of, all of the uh, local teams, local countries, and both of them uh, uh, notoriously defeated England. And throughout the, the rest of the 20th century, the two countries developed as the dominant uh, rugby-playing countries. Uh, the first two series between the countries were, were drawn series, so nobody won. So it wasn't until 1937 that one of the sides uh, came to dominate. And rugby increasingly became the sport by which white South Africans in particular, especially Afrikaans-speaking white South Africans, those Dutch-descended peoples, uh, focused their identity on. Even before 1948, when the National Party comes to power, uh, segregation is practiced within South African sport. There was an opportunity uh, as far back as 1896 to select a uh, mixed race or colored um, bowler, Crom Hendricks, to play for South Africa against England, and the selectors refused to pick him because he wasn't fully white. And so when we talk about representative South African teams right the way up until uh, the late 70s, early 80s, all of the players would be white. Which were the sports that caused most international anger as far as that apartheid system was concerned. People uh, in the international community started to say we're not going to play with you if, if you're going to exclude uh, your countrymen. In the late 1950s uh, South African athletes, particularly black South African athletes, began to organize themselves and connect with international groups. And one of the things they did um, initially was the Table Tennis Federation followed by the weightlifters applied for recognition by the international federations and they refused because white South African federations were already connected. But many uh, people who opposed apartheid started to focus on sport, particularly around the Olympic movement. And this happened about the time many African countries were gaining independence in the early 1960s and had equal voting rights um, on international federations, uh, influence within the Olympic movement, and they were backed and supported by the Soviet Union, who used apartheid and apartheid sport as a way to leverage themselves as being supportive of African aspirations and supportive of black South African athletes. So South Africa is stopped from participating in the 1964 Olympic Games and again in 1968 and then in 1970 expelled from the Olympic movement. Meanwhile, within um, 
Britain, Australia, other, other parts of the, the old Commonwealth empire, um, young groups and, and uh, leftist groups, as you know, po politics became more radicalized in the 1960s, began to oppose uh, sporting tours by South Africa. So uh, there's a boycott um, uh, advocated and then disruption to tours uh, led by, in some cases, uh, expatriate South Africans like Peter Hain, who later became a member of parliament for the Labour Party in Britain. Um, and so cricket tours stopped to Australia, England, New Zealand, etc. Um, by the uh, by 1970. Then uh, with South Africa out of the Olympic movement, cricket tours stopped. The real focal point became rugby. And rugby was the one sport that really matters to the white South African government and its supporters. So with South Africa being an international pariah, what effect does this have internally? One of the things that happened is by 1977, uh, white South Africans were surveyed and asked, what are the three most damaging consequences of apartheid? And one of the three that was mentioned was the lack of international contact in sport. If you go back to 1967, New Zealand cancels a rugby tour of South Africa because South Africa won't let native New Zealanders, the Maori, participate as part of the New Zealand team. This leads the South African government itself to suggest that they would let Maoris in future come in as honorary whites. And some members of the government break away to form a new political party because of this change in policy over a sporting tour. In 1970, New Zealand comes, government changes again in New Zealand, and they prevent a tour planned for 1973 because they're afraid it will disrupt the Commonwealth Games. South Africa doesn't participate, but New Zealand does, and they were the hosts in 74. They send diplomats all over Africa to try to prevent a boycott. So rugby becomes a real focal point, and then it becomes even bigger when we lead into the Montreal Olympic Games in 1976 because New Zealand elects a conservative government who runs on the basis of restoring rugby tours as one of their key platforms. So in 76, New Zealand goes to South Africa, and it happens at the time of the Soweto student uprising and the Soweto student massacre, which began on June 16, 1976, very uh, shortly before the Montreal Olympics and the African nations boycott en masse because New Zealand is a participant. So the level of pressure gets increasingly escalated over time. And then finally in 1981, South Africa sends a team to New Zealand, which leads to the closest thing to civil war New Zealand had ever seen, riot police in the street, the first match, there was a plane, a plane in the air threatening to fly into the stadium. First match televised in South Africa on live TV was canceled and white protesters were seen on the field. And so this let black South Africans know for the first time visually that there were foreign white people supporting them while rugby fans in South Africa said, what the hell is going on in New Zealand? And, you know, why, are, why is our rugby being disrupted? There was a level of hostility and a, a level of anger and a sense of bewilderment um, around the world about w how this would resolve itself without mass bloodshed. And here we've got sport as maybe being one of the, of the touch papers of, of a mm. civil war, of, of any kind of, uh, of trouble. Mm. How does this resolve itself? And, and who is the person that resolves it? What happens is after the, after the 81 tour, um, most people were saying that you know, normal sport is absolutely impossible. Um, you know, the, the movement in South Africa argued that there could be no normal sport in an abnormal society. The government had tried a multinational, multiracial sports policy that completely failed. Everyone saw it was just window dressing, as they said, and not, not real change. Um, but what began to happen in the middle of the 1980s is really important. Uh, the Rugby uh, World Cup was established to begin in 1987. And the countries that were participating, um, you know, they wanted enough countries to make it 
legitimate and and not just look like three or four competitive countries were playing. So they had countries like Samoa, Fiji, and others who might be involved. And it was being hosted jointly by Australia and New Zealand. And Australia, um, their government had a very hard line under Bob Hawke and Paul Keating against South Africa. And they would not allow South Africa to participate. At that very moment, Donnie Craven, who was the president of the South African Rugby Union from 1956 to 1992, Donnie Craven starts having secret meetings with the African National Congress in exile, the, party, the, the political movement that was headed by Nelson Mandela, who was in prison still at the time, Oliver Tambo in exile. And so Craven is meeting with the leaders of the ANC even before the South African government does because he wanted to restore rugby and South African presence in rugby to its, its former place. But he kind of gets backstabbed by the head of the Transvaal Association, Louis Late, who organizes a rebel tour of New Zealand players to come over in 86. Uh, they beat South Africa, but not by much, and then go on to win the World Cup in 87. So this creates a real sense of angst because white South Africans say, hey, wait a minute, we, we are as good, but we can't play. Um, and so there's this real tension. It also was a tense moment for Craven because he's trying to find under what conditions would the ANC support a return of rugby. And because of this initiative, when Mandela is released and when um, normalization of sport begins to occur, South Africa is given the right to host the 1995 Rugby World Cup, and we all know from the movie Invictus and remembering, uh, you know, the time, if we haven't seen the movie but we're there, you know, that Mandela really does embrace rugby as a way to reach out to whites for reconciliation. This is a way of uh, achieving a multiracial society through sport, isn't it? Or really what, what uh, others would say is a non-racial society because everybody is treated equally um, however, there has been a lot of tension since that time because it was still basically a takeover of black sporting structures by established white organizations. And even though players could be picked equally, access to the best facilities, et cetera, weren't really there. Now, this kind of takes us beyond the Cold War, but what it does is it, it does show how um, the, the political economy of events is also interwoven with this kind of cultural uh, use of sport as a, as a lever point against apartheid. And at the same time, there are comings and goings further down the street, as it were, in, in Africa. There are attempts uh, by the Soviet Union to achieve penetration into other countries, aren't there, and for it to fall into different blocks. How does South Africa fit into the, the Southern Africa narrative? Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the key things is, the uh, firstly, um, even more so, the role of the United States. Um, South Africa is supported uh, particularly um, in, a, in a kind of covert way by the Reagan administration, and the policies were headed by Chester Crocker, the Under Secretary of State, who promoted a notion of constructive engagement, where we would, uh, the U.S. government would kind of say, we abhor apartheid, it's bad, while at the same time buy the minerals and, you know, help South Africa towards some kind of settlement. Um, and this was seen by many uh, outside as, as not real attempt to change and that the U.S. was really supporting and propping up South Africa. Um, many of the same criticisms were leveled at the Thatcher government in Britain, and they were the two most important. But uh, after 1975, when Angola and Mozambique become independent, um, both countries have uh, established government faced by rebel forces who have opposing political views. The government that takes control in Angola is a Marxist-Leninist-influenced government, covertly supported by the Soviets, but overtly supported by Cuban troops who come in to fight on the side of the government but to also protect the Gulf oil drilling rights that the new Marxist-Leninist government honors, as had the Salazar fascist regime from, uh, from uh, Portugal in the old days. And the United States, 
supports South Africa, who is fighting for the uh, groups in the countryside who are much more right wing and much more pro capitalism, um, you know, and 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 uh, don't have a socialist bent. While in Mozambique, the United States supports the socialist and socialist leaning government. Um, while the South Africans fight on the side of the right-wing rebels. And so the U.S. and South Africa are on different sides in the two different conflicts, while the Soviet Union is, is quite happily letting this go along. What the Soviets did was they leveraged support, first of all, by supporting uh, African countries in the sports movement, and then secondly, by funding uh, much of the African National Congress resistance, including weapons from Konto Isizwe, the armed wing of the African National Congress, which was led by um, the South African Communist Party leader, Joe Slovo, a white South African, but a, a high-ranking member of the ANC, who was one of the leading government ministers in the new government with Mandela. So it was a very complex situation in which South Africa uh, the regime was largely supported by the Americans and the British, and the resistance movement was supported by the Soviets, not because the ANC necessarily wanted it at first. There's tensions within it between the communist and anti-communist groups, but because the U.S. and the British wouldn't give the ANC the support, so the Soviets happily stepped in. South Africa was a, a major player in global sports, if not on the level of, of the U.S. And the, and the Soviet Union, certainly by far the most prominent African nation in sports. You've been listening to a podcast from the series Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, a project bringing together experts from around the world and hosted here on the Wilson Centre's online digital archive at digitalarchive.org. These podcasts are part of the project The Global History of Sport in the Cold War, which is sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities, directed by Professor Bob Edelman of UC San Diego, Professor Chris Young from the University of Cambridge, and Dr Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Centre, and run in collaboration with the German Historical Institute Moscow, the Jordan Centre for Advanced Russian Studies at New York University, and Pembroke College, University of Cambridge. The presenter is Vince Hunt and the series is produced by Vince Hunt and Laura Deal.